Okay, good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing this morning? So, a little early, I understand, but that's okay. I think uh, Dustin and I are going to try to entertain you here for about an hour, talking a little bit about memory care and uh, kind of where the trends are in today's world as far as developing memory care environments, uh, particularly on retirement campuses. Um, my name is Eric McRoberts, uh, partner with RLPS Architects. We're up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Those of you that don't know, Amish country uh, around Lancaster. We are not Amish, though. Um, I've been with the firm now for about 30 years, and uh, my entire career has pretty much been dedicated to senior living. Uh, all aspects of senior living, from independent living to assisted living, uh, to health care, to memory care. Um, Dustin, a little bit about yourself. Dustin Julius, uh, I've been with the firm now uh, going into my third year. Um, haven't mm -hmm. had quite as much experience, but I've had a lot of fun getting to know the industry and uh, bringing sort of uh, some of the technology to the work that we do um, and had, you know, just really enjoy the, the opportunities that we get to, to share with all of you. So. One of the things that um, we've had the opportunity in recent years to do is work with a group called the Alzheimer's Resource Center up in Connecticut. They are one of the leading um, research uh, entities in the country regarding memory care and ways of dealing with memory care. They also have a facility, a uh, neighborhood on campus, so they do a lot of research with their own residents, uh, and we're going to bring some of that to bear today in our presentation. So, One of the things I often like to talk about with memory care is everyone asks us, what's the best environment, what's the best way to provide a secure memory unit on your campus? And the answer to that question is there really isn't a good answer because everyone does it differently. Uh, with some things, there is a right way and a wrong way. With memory care, that's really not the case. Uh, and we're going to show you a number of different ways that it can be dealt with. Some work for some communities, whereas that same product may not work for another community based on things like size and also the level of person that you're dealing with in memory care. Uh, as a preempt to this, one of the things that we want to talk about is the fact that oftentimes when we're dealing with memory care, we're talking about environments for, for probably the first, second, and third stages of dementia. Once a person develops dementia in fourth and fifth stages, um, they're typically more in a healthcare, skilled care environment. Not only cognitively have they lost a lot of their ability, but also physically, where they can't really motivate around the campus, circulate on their own. So when we talk about memory care, we're really talking about it in this, at an assisted living level, where a person is still very active, they're walking, they're moving around, they're participating in activities, but they just need a supportive environment to help them live a very fulfilling life. I'd like to show this pyramid because it really deals with the four ways that we often think about memory care. Probably in today's world, um, the most common way to deal with memory care is what we call a household model. It's basically creating a small home that a group of probably 12 to 15 residents might live in. Very nurturing, very residential, feels like home, and I think it's why many people have gravitated toward that concept. Um, from there, we go to something that's a little bit different, which we simply call a neighborhood. Neighborhoods are oftentimes in existing buildings where we want to develop kind of a self-contained kind of area for memory care, and it's what you guys are talking about potentially doing here on the campus. And from there, you can see in terms of scale, we get to this idea of creating this downtown or Main Street. This was very popular about 10 years ago, where you would create these Main Streets that were simulating <clears throat> kind of a downtown setting so folks would have the ability to go to a barber shop and an ice cream parlor and a movie theater, and it was all kind of recreated. <clears throat> it was a little bit like a Disney concept, though. It was all kind of not real, but the idea was you were creating an environment that felt real. And we've moved away from that a little bit in recent years because there was kind of a fakeness to it, and a lot of people weren't uh, crazy about that idea. And then finally, we want to talk about this idea of creating a village. A village is just a group of people living together in a community. Um, we're going to show you some examples, particularly one in the Netherlands uh, called Hajway, that uh, basically created an entire village 
of about 100 and I think it's about 130 people that live within that village. Uh, but it includes everything they need. Uh, so it's almost like a little downtown in a way, but it's also a very strong community of folks living with dementia. So again, through that continuum there, there's any number of ways that we can do this. And graphically, we want to show you some examples of each one of those. So the household model, I think, is the most easy for everyone to understand because it's basically just creating a home. Um, you can see here's an example. We call, often call them small houses. There's a term in the industry called a greenhouse, which is a patented uh, type of house which only includes 10 people. In households, we generally think that we want to keep the numbers smaller. So there's a little more intimacy. There's a little higher level of care. The one that we did uh, in Allentown, Pennsylvania was interesting because it was a community for Jehovah's Witnesses. They were folks that were sponsoring this household. Uh, and basically, they thought that 12 was the right number for them. You can see that it's in a very residential community. <clears throat> This is not part of a bigger retirement community. It's simple, simply a household that was built for memory care. Uh, this was the memory care household. This was the assisted living without memory care household across the street from it. And you can see the first thing you realize is that it feels like a home. There's nothing really very different about it. It could be a house that you, you or I live in. Uh, there's a very residential component as far as a garage. That's the service part of the house. So they bring the food in, the trash out, all the other services that come in out simply go through the garage. So there's no big loading dock or anything like you'd see in kind of a larger retirement community. Uh, very, very residential front door, a uh, nice little porch out front. So again, you look at this building, you would not know it's memory care. There's nothing about it that says that it's any different than a place that you or I would live in. But when you look at the plan, you can see there's a couple of things that are very distinctive. First thing is, you can see all the resident rooms are kind of on one side of the plan. The common space, which is the kitchen and the living room and the dining room are on this side. And then the garage, as I mentioned, is the service side of the plan. One of the things that we liked about this, and one of the things that's very important with memory care, is the idea of, of the sun and the patterns of the sun as it tracks across the sky. Um, so we want to make sure that the common space is staying bright and cheerful all day long. And it's one of the reasons we like to basically make sure that we have daylight coming in from both sides of the plan. So you get, in the morning you might get sun from this side, in the afternoon you get sun from this side. But we also in this plan wanted to make sure we developed the idea of there's a private part of the plan and there's a public part of the plan. And then as I mentioned, there's a service side of the plan that you really don't see. Um, there's the daylight that I mentioned. We also bring daylight into the plan back here through some skylights. I think the way a project is lit is very important to the success of the project. When you have spaces that are dark and dreary, I think they tend to not work very well for, for memory care. One of the most important things about the plan, and we'll talk about this as we go through other examples, is the idea that there's a circulation path through the plan that is in some way reminiscent of a loop. Uh, as we all know, when people develop dementia, a certain percentage of them will wander. They want to be motivated, walking all the time. And it's important to kind of build this idea of a walking path through the plan. What we want to avoid in memory care is the idea of dead-end hallways. Because if you have a dead-end hallway and there's a door at the end of that hallway, I can guarantee the resident's going to want to know what's on the other side of that door. Why can't I go through that door? Why is it locked? Um, so this is a way to kind of get around that without developing those corridors. And then some imagery just to show you what these begin to look like. Again, feels like home. Uh, very open plan like we talked about at some other, uh, even looking at some, some independent living, the idea that people really want this idea of a very, very open plan. Um, jump back here, you can see the kitchen. You can see the dining room here. Lots of daylight from this side of the plan and lots of daylight from that side of the plan. Vaulted ceiling in the living room, clear story windows, so just flooding it with daylight all day long. There's the fireplace, there's the living room space. Again, you look at this and you wouldn't know it's any different than a regular home. It feels very, very similar. But it's simply a, a, an environment that 12 people with dementia can live in very, very comfortably. Outdoor porches, 
One of the things with outdoor spaces, we really feel that it's very important to connect to the outdoors, but you need to do them in a safe way, that a resident can get out there. In this case, it's a porch that's elevated. Uh, we actually did put in a screen so that residents can't go over the, over the rail. Um, we often will do gardens, and those gardens are typically fenced in, in a way that's done that it's not obvious that we're trying to keep people within. But with me memory care and dementia, we do have to be very concerned about elopement. Residents will tend to want to get out, to go home. Uh, that happens all the time. So we need to create a very, very safe environment. And then as far as the resident rooms go, there's really not that much different about a resident room in memory care, different than even, let's say, skilled care or health care components. Um, the rooms tend to be smaller because the idea is we don't want the residents in the room a lot of the day. The idea is we want the residents out of the rooms in programs and activities most of the day. So we really try to keep the rooms relatively small. You can see that we basically, very similar to a skilled care room, you've got a nice bed, a place maybe for a table or some furniture. You've got a full bathroom with a European or three by five shower. So everything they need is within that space. But again, most of the time's not gonna be spent here. It's a place to sleep but all during the day, when the active part of the day, you're out doing other things. One of the things that uh, has been very popular for many years, and I think there's still some validity to it, is the idea that when a person is in bed, they have the ability to see the bathroom or the toilet. Because what will happen oftentimes, depending on the level of dementia, a person will wake up in the middle of the night, they're not sure why they woke up, they actually have to go to the bathroom, if they see the bathroom, it'll remind them, oh, that's why I got up, and they'll use the bathroom. If you don't do that, I think we found that levels of incontinence uh, become more prevalent. Uh, so it's just one of those little things that we still often do in memory care. And then there's a typical bedroom. Not big, not fancy, but uh, again, it's more the common space, the living room spaces uh, that are important in that sense. Just another example of a small house. This is one that's up in uh, York, Pennsylvania. Uh, Normandy Ridge, again, a very small, about a 12 to 15 bed unit. Uh, you can see very residential, kind of designed kind of around a courtyard here. And I, uh, you know, again, the residents can get out into that courtyard. It's a safe environment. And again, some things here you'll notice that are similar to the previous plan that we saw. Uh, you can see the resident rooms kind of ring the outside. In this case, they did want to get the bed count up a little bit, so we actually had a couple of semi-private rooms. And there are still occasionally residents who like the idea of having a roommate. It's just the idea of the social aspect of that. And very often we will see one or two semi-private rooms. Uh, although privates are certainly the standard, most people think that memory care, private rooms are the way to go. But again, the core of this plan, you can see it's all living and activity space, a nice open porch, a nice little courtyard here that residents can get out into. And then you can see the staff component right there. Kitchen here, this happens to be connected to another building. So some of the services can kind of come this way. Food comes into the kitchen and then serves right out into the dining room. And again, there's that loop that we talked about. It's very subtle, but it's there. So if a resident is a wanderer and they want to move through the plan, um, you know, I think at least we have a window here, but the idea is a resident's going to walk down here and they're going to be a little frustrated maybe when they get there because they can't go any further than that. So we want to try to avoid that. Sorry, this clicker's a little jumpy. And again, just uh, residential setting, fireplaces. There's nothing wrong with fireplaces. It's a very residential thing. We, we all love fireplaces. Why not do them in memory care as well? And just some of the spaces that uh, this happens to be a parlor. Um, a parlor is an interesting space in memory care because very often we want to make sure that every neighborhood or household has a parlor, a room with a door, so that you can have an activity in that room with a closed door. Uh, you could do a consultation with a family member. You can use it as a conference room. It can be a staff area. It's really a catch-all room, but we really feel that almost all of the neighborhoods need to have this kind of a room that you can close a door for privacy. And again, here's the kitchen in that particular plan. Very open. Some people like the idea of the one big table, particularly because we're talking about a relatively small number of residents, 10 to 12 that the idea is everybody eats at one table. It's more of a family setting. Uh, you really get to know, you. it's like a big family essentially. You're, it's, like, it's like Thanksgiving dinner every day. Uh, you're sitting all at one big table with staff. Uh, and then oftentimes we do provide kind of a counter at the kitchen. So if somebody does want to eat more alone, there's that opportunity as well. 
And again, the bedroom in this particular case. Here we did hardwood floors, but it is very common to do carpeting. Uh, carpeting is very residential, it's soft, it's good acoustically. But you can see we certainly try to flood the space with daylight. Lighting even, if it's important, we want to make sure there's not a lot of glare with lighting, so we typically will bounce the light off the ceiling so there's a nice even level of light throughout the room. Okay, spas, um, these don't get used a lot. I think the, the challenge with spas is for someone with dementia, we do find the tubs are scary. They don't look like a regular tub. Oftentimes you have to get lifted up into the tub or there's a door that opens, you get into the tub and then it fills with water. Um, I'm not sure I would like that. So imagine someone with dementia. But we find that these, these spas, even though they're still required by code, they really don't get used very much. Oftentimes they become storage rooms. Now if you can treat it in a nice way that it looks really nice, um, you can make it more of an activity. You're going for a relaxing bath. You can do aromatherapy. You can do a lot of music and things like that. So it's really more of an event. And I think that's the way that a lot of communities are starting to address it, that it's a real, it's like going to the spa. You know, it's, it's just a really nice thing to do on a Tuesday afternoon. And that's why the hair care is often Yeah, and you saw, yeah, as you saw, hair care also is typically included. So it really does become a spa where you can get a lot of different things done. Get your hair done, manicure, pedicure. You can soak in a tub. Uh, all those kinds of nice, relaxing things. Williamsburg Landing, a project a little closer to here, many of you might be familiar with, White Williamsburg, uh, is just completing their memory care right now. A um, little bit of a different plan, uh, really kind of two households, a 12-bed neighborhood here and a 12-bed neighborhood here, with kind of a shared commons in the middle. Uh, so it's really kind of two separate neighborhoods, but they do blend them a little bit, so it's really a 24-bed neighborhood. And oftentimes we're asked, what's the ideal number of residents in a neighborhood? There's not a good answer to that. And it depends how you staff it. Um, some people will tell you 13 to 15 is kind of the sweet spot. Uh, a lot of people will tell you that 10, which is the greenhouse model, is a tough one because it's, it's such a smaller number of people. But, but it does create an int intimacy. In this case, it's 24. That's a little bit on the bigger side. And they think that's going to work very well for them. Again, the loops are built into the plan as well as kind of the ability to kind of walk from one side to the other. So lots of walking opportunities in that plan. Uh, and then one of the things that they've done, which we're not seeing typically anymore, is the idea of an adult daycare neighborhood below this building. It's a separate place where people are dropped off who have memory care. A loved one would drop them off. You'd spend the day there in a program. And then at the end of the day, you're picked up and you're taken back home again. Um, we were seeing a lot of these a number of years ago, but I think they've fallen out of favor because many of them have struggled financially um, to keep them full. So what we are seeing more typically now is when we develop a memory care neighborhood, a household, whatever, we simply take the living spaces in that plan and we make them bigger than need, they need to be so that residents can get dropped off and participate in the memory care building. And maybe it's only five to six residents. Um, and then basically they go home at night. So you work them into the program that you're always r already running, your staff is already there. It seems to be financially a much better way to deal with adult daycare than this way. But I think at, at Williamsburg Landing, they feel that they have enough population and census that they're gonna be able to keep this pretty full. Oops. So that's the first model, it's the house model. And the, the pros of this type of, of of way of dealing with memory care, which I think is probably the most current model that we're seeing most people develop. The benefits are the scale. It's a very small residential scale, which most people really like that, that fact. Very secure. Uh, it's all within a house, small, uh, small number of people, staff have good control, visibility of what's going on. It remains very residential, and I think that's one of the reasons it's so popular. Because for a person living with cognitive issues, it still feels like home. So it's very comfortable. It's not agitating, which is one of the things we're trying to avoid. And there's that real sense of support and family. And I think that's one of the reasons the household model is so popular, because it's a very nurturing environment for people living with, with cognitive issues. The cons of this model is sometimes when you're only dealing with 10 to 12 residents, the staffing costs are quite high. You're providing a very high level of care 
but the staffing maybe is a little bit more than in a bigger model that we'll show you in a little bit. And the other issue that some people say can be problematic is the fact that those 10 to 12 people that live in your neighborhood, that's your whole life, those 10 to 12 people. And then you're not basically participating in the larger social activities that might be going on. Uh, but certainly that could be dealt with, you know, making sure that those residents have the ability to get out of their household, participate in some bigger events. So there are ways to deal with this. The second one we want to talk about is the idea of a neighborhood. Neighborhoods can be in an existing building or they could be something that's brand new. And we're going to show you kind of both ideas. Um, but the idea is a neighborhood's typically maybe a little bit bigger than a household. doesn't have to be. Um, but an example of this where it was existing spaces up at the Osborne in, in Rye, New York, where they had an existing independent living wing on a lower level that really wasn't being utilized because they couldn't sell the apartments. So it was pretty much vacant. So here's, here's what it looks like. It's quite an impressive place. Um, a lot of independent living on this campus, but they didn't have a dedicated memory care. So here's the garden, and this is basically the level right here that they talked about developing into memory care. And they had this beautiful garden that they really wanted to take advantage of. Um, so here's the plan. Here's the neighborhood that we are talking about right here. First thing that comes to mind is you look at it and it's a linear plan. Linear plans don't work well for memory care because there's two dead end corridors at either end of the hallway. So we really had an uphill battle to determine how do you turn this into a nice neighborhood. Um, so we took that plan and there you can see it existing. And basically again, I'll just jump back here. You can see the existing plan, a number of independent living units that were very small. Gar that beautiful garden is right here. And what we did basically is turn it into a 13 bed neighborhood. Now I think it's hard to look at the plan and say, okay, that just doesn't really look like a very nice memory care unit. But I think when you get into the imagery of this, you'll see that it actually feels very, very nice inside. All 13 rooms are private. They all have private bathrooms. They all have European showers, meaning the floor and the shower of the bathroom kind of just roll into one. There's no threshold to roll a wheelchair over, which is very nice. Uh, we have a little bit of a loop in the plan. You can see that we did put one addition on, which was right here, out into that garden. So it really takes advantage of that. And then at the end of the space, we did create kind of an activity room. It used to be a storage room, and we created kind of an activity room down there. So there's something happening at the end. And there it is. This is what that, that storage room looked like at the end of the hallway. Not the best situation for memory care. But basically, we turned that into this activity center where they do laundry, and they do some other types of activity. It's an art room. Uh, they do a lot of different things down here, and now it's, it's, it's just something happening at the end of the hallway that captures their interest, and I think that's actually worked very well. What's really changed this plan is kind of this, this bubble that we put in the middle of it that extends out into the courtyard. Uh, we've got this very open country kitchen, serving kitchen. You can see here's what it looks like in real life. Uh, people are always concerned about kitchens and memory care, that it's a dangerous place. It doesn't have to be a dangerous place, as long as you take the precautions that you need. Residents can wander in and out of this on their own. They can get themselves a drink. Uh, again, you're trying to create a feeling that there's still independence in a person, that everything isn't being served to them. They still have meaning in life. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, real objectives with memory care. And Dustin did a, a whole charrette with the Alzheimer's Resource Center where they really approached it in a very different way and they talked about the meanings of memory care and what's really important at the end of the day. And we'll finish up the session today talking about that. Uh, again, the living room, you can see right there with a, a TV. There's that living room. One of the things that you'll notice here is the, all the color that's included in the project. For a long time, we did memory care and other senior living uh, without a lot of color. Because we thought, particularly in memory care, that maybe color would be distracting, it'd be disorienting. And the fact that I think we've realized it's just the opposite. Residents really love the idea of introducing a lot of color to a plan. And it's a great way to cue people, too. Cueing is very critical so that a person who is living with dementia, who might be confused a little bit, has ways of picking up where they are in a plan or where they're going. They understand the plan a little bit better. But this really was the big, the big effort in this plan is this sunroom. And again, this opens right to this beautiful garden. Residents can freely walk out into that garden. It has been fenced off, so it's secure. Uh, they can't really go anywhere. But it really has created this very nice indoor-outdoor relationship 
to, to a real beautiful amenity that was on the campus. And again, just some of the imagery, very residential again. Only 13 people live in this neighborhood, and this has been a very, very successful project. Again, there's that fireplace. And then this idea of queuing again, we've done it in many ways. This is a resident room. This gentleman happened to be a big golfer in his <coughs> earlier life. So what these guys do is they use the idea of artwork to queue a room. So a resident who's walking down a hallway, who's trying to get back to his room, sees this, and that immediately triggers, oh, that's my room. There's those golf clubs. Because again, it's something he was very passionate about earlier in his life. We've done the curio cabinets. Um, we used to think that was a great idea. All that little knick-knacky stuff in the curio cabinet, I don't think we feel it really works that well. I think families like it because they like to put little trinkets of, of someone's past there. Um, but we sometimes, we've kind of moved away from this a little bit in some recent projects. There's some other ways to handle it too. We see <clears throat> some communities will choose to use like a hutch, so it's more of a, something that you can update more easily rather than a built-in. So there's different ways to do that same sort of thing uh, in, a, in a piece of furniture. At Williamsburg Landing, when we did a memory care quite a few years ago, the original one, um, we made sure the foyer just inside the front door to each resident room was big enough for that piece of furniture that, that Dustin's talking about so that if somebody had an old heirloom table or something that they could put right there, when they're walking down the hallway, again, that would trigger, oh, that's my room because there's my table. Uh, just ways of finding where you're going in a plan. And here are the typical rooms. Um, one of the things about memory care that we have learned over the years is that people tend to want to move their bed all over the place. Um, so sometimes making the furniture a little bit more mobile, the wardrobe, the dresser versus built in, some people feel there's logic to that because you'll find that the bed oftentimes is not as it's shown here, it's pushed into the corner over here. Something about the security having a wall on two sides of the bed is very popular in memory care. And here's an example of a bathroom. Uh, this is that European shower that we mentioned. Uh, we really like the idea of the sliding door because it gets the door out of the way. A hinge door can be really problematic in terms of getting around a hinge door. But the sink is directly outside the bathroom, and then you can see you through a door, you've got the toilet and the shower. That's very typical, not just in memory care, really in, in all levels of, of higher care. So neighbor, the neighborhood, the renovated model, the pros, certainly economical, uh, still a very supportive environment, very secure. We've got the garden connections. And the one thing that's nice about being connected to an existing building is you begin to have a little better connection to the larger community. So that idea of larger socialization could certainly happen a little more easily. The cons, um, as was with Rye New York with the Osborne, very limited in terms of the existing plan. There are probably things we wish we could have done, but because we're working with an existing building, you have a certain amount of limitation there. And a linear plan, not the best idea in terms of laying out a memory care. We made it work here, but if we were designing a new project, we certainly wouldn't do a linear plan. It just doesn't really work very well. The second idea with a neighborhood is the, a brand new one when you're basically a greenfield project. And this was one actually that dates back quite a while, but I still think it has some relevance. Uh, this was a larger memory care, but it was done in a way that we had four 12-bed neighborhoods, one, two, three, four, around kind of a common area. And you can see this is the garden. So again, a real sense of a garden community that residents could go out into the garden um, in this case, they determined 12 was the right number. They thought 12 was good for memory care, for scale. Uh, each neighborhood kind of got a front door that felt like a front porch. Uh, so it had a very residential first impression. Um, and then here's a typical neighborhood. One of the things that was interesting about this plan is you will see the absence of anything that looks like a corridor. There are no corridors in this plan. So what happened is we basically ringed the project with resident rooms here, the 12, and then everything that happens in between them just became the common space. But you can see there's really not a corridor in the plan. So in terms of a resident just kind of having the ability to wander wherever they want to go, freedom to move throughout the plan, uh, it really worked out very, very well. There was, in this case, a kitchen that served both neighborhoods. There was efficiency in that, and that's something we often like to do uh, with memory care. Doing a kitchen for only 10 or 12 people is very costly. But if we can take a kitchen and share it between two 12-bed neighborhoods, then it becomes a lot more efficient. 
Okay, so there are the 12 private rooms as I mentioned. And then everything in between really becomes the common space. So you can see that really doesn't look like a corridor. It just looks like space. Uh, we brought, introduced some skylights here in the middle. Uh, there's any, type, any number of kind of different nodes, activities that happen along the way. This is kind of the music corner. This was the, uh, the men's corner where they had a lot of uh, football paraphernalia. Uh, there was, this was the staff desk, which was just an open desk. This was the garden kind of area right here that led you right out into the garden. So really lots of different opportunities in the plan. And here's what it looks like just as a, as a imagery. Uh, you know, things like little desks where a person could stop and write a letter. You know, there might be a, a game table here. Uh, this was a little area for different types of uh, uh, artifacts that uh, might relate to the folks that live there. And one of the things that we've certainly seen with many of these communities is the idea that you, you have to really understand the folks that are living there currently. What's their history? What's their background? What were their interests? Because if you can tailor the interior to a lot of those things that they will have a long-term memory of, it's gonna make it a much more comfortable environment for them. So if somebody was, um, let's say somebody was a nurse and you knew that they were a nurse their whole life, you would do some things, you would buy some things that reflect that. So they would again, just make it a little bit more comfortable for that person. They've probably lost their short-term memory, but it's amazing how many of these people have a crystal clear long-term memory. My grandmother was one of these. I could not believe the things that she could remember from 50 years ago. What somebody was wearing on a certain day. She had that vision in her head and she knew it, but she could not tell you what she had for breakfast. It's amazing. Okay, and then these nodal points that I talked about, all these different things, uh, one of the things that was very important in this plan is that each one of these had a connection to the outdoors. And you can see based on where the sun might be, it's different at each one of those locations, different times of the day. This might be north directly up, so at one time of the day, you know, the sun's coming in, rising on this side. One time of the day, it's, it's kind of setting on this side. So you're getting different qualities of light in the community all day long. Very important. For this type of a, a newer memory care setting, uh, very engaging. Again, very personal to the particular residents that live there. You're giving the residents a lot of choice. And I think that's where that freedom comes into play, that you're, you're not defining the person's day all day long in a very scheduled routine. You're letting them decide what their day is going to be. And the idea of it being corridor-less, I think that's a very important thing. Uh, the cons. Um, there are definitely some regulatory issues when you develop a plan that's as open as this, because the, the codes talk about corridors and handrails and things like that. Well, we don't have corridors, so we didn't have places to put handrails. So we ran into a lot of issues with the regulatory agencies on how to get this approved because they hadn't seen anything like it before. Uh, and then the other thing is just looking at that plan very quickly, lots of ins and outs. You can just see, you know, all, I mean, it's not a square box by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and with that comes cost. So this was not an inexpensive uh, project to build, but it was a very successful memory care project. And this one dates back, I think Peabody was at least 15 years ago. So this was pretty forward thinking at the time. One of the interesting ones that was really popular about 10, 15 years ago was the idea of let's develop a main street. Um, where we recreate a downtown and the folks that are living there think they're living downtown. They're really not because it's Disney-like, it's kind of fake. But one of the projects that we had the uh, ability to work on was a project up in Connecticut called the Waveney Care Center. And this was a project in New Canaan, Connecticut where they had a lovely downtown. Most of the residents who lived, were gonna live here came from the New Canaan area. So their thought was why don't we recreate New Canaan inside the building? So everyone sees the buildings and they recognize them. Oh, that's the old post office. It's really not the old post office. It's a replica of the old post office. Um, we've gotten away from this a little bit, but I, I thought it was important to show it because it's still very successful. It's a different way of dealing with memory care on a much bigger scale. This is not the 12 people that we talked about in some of these households. Um, so the Main Street uh, in this particular project one of the things that made this very successful 
that certainly cost a lot of money. And this is New Canaan where we talk about their, the color of their money is a little different color green than everyone else's money. It's a very, very, very affluent place. Uh, I think they did a little fundraiser and they raised $10 million literally in, in two months to pay for this building. So it's, it was amazing. So we don't always have that kind of a budget to work with. But one of the things that you can see is very unique about this Main Street is the entire thing was covered with a skylight. So you literally felt like you were outside when you were in Main Street. Uh, Main Street's about 30 feet wide and it's about 130 feet long and there's a gentle bend to it so that you're not seeing the whole thing at one time. There's this idea there's something around the corner which was very successful. But here's the plan. What's interesting about this plan is there are a certain number of people that live here. And there are neighborhoods of 13. There's one here and there's one here. This is actually a two-story building. So there are 52 people that live here permanently. And the idea with this project is that you're trying to recreate the pattern of a person's regular day. You get up in the morning, you bathe. You have breakfast in your neighborhood. But then you go to work or whatever you're going to do for the active part of your day. And that's where Main Street comes in. And Main Street, and here's that, here's that neighborhood uh, uh, kind of country kitchen kind of dining area. This is New Canaan where modern architecture is very, very prevalent. And these guys have attached themselves to some Scandinavian designs. And they've got a number of other buildings that are built, done in that same way. So that's why you look at this and the, the lines are very clean, kind of very Scandinavian. It's the imagery that they were looking for. This actually is the care base. Uh, in that particular neighborhood of 13. It's just a desk in the kitchen. But basically your breakfast would be served here. This happens to be the high school across the way and this is the track right here. So these guys have a front row view of all the track meets going on and the folks running by right here. So it's kind of also interesting. Gives them something to uh, uh, participate in. So this is Main Street and this really was the essence of the project. A couple things about Main Street. Um, again, it's completely skylit. At both ends, here and here, a complete glass wall that takes you right out to a secure garden here and a secure garden here. Now, all of the things in downtown New Canaan we tried to replicate here. There is a beauty shop, barber shop. There is a bakery. There's an ice cream parlor. There's a little theater. Um, there's a little dining piazza down here at the end. There's a country store uh, that don't really sell anything, but that's okay. People kind of still think like they're buying things. But again, there's, a, there's an element of fakery here. And it works. I mean, I have to be honest, it works. And the thing that, was, that surprised most people about this concept is there are 52 people that live here. And then there are another 30 to 35 that get dropped off as part of an adult daycare program. They come in the door, they organize here, and then these folks also go into Main Street. Everybody that lives here is on Main Street all day long. So from 9 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock at night, you're participating in activities. You don't go back to your room. They don't allow you to go back to your room. So again, you're recreating the idea of memory care, of, of a person's life. You go to work, you're at work all day, you're not going back to your bedroom when you're working. Um, and, and again, it's just recreating that pattern that is very familiar to people because most of them work most of their life. So what you end up getting uh, here's Main Street. You can see we even used cobblestone carpet. We used a, <laughs> it's a cobblestone printed carpet. We used exterior street lights. Uh, you can see right there. There's a clock which is reminiscent of downtown New Canaan. We used brick. Uh, this is the second floor of the folks that live here looking down into Main Street. Uh, the sidewalk is just a gray carpet. It's not really a sidewalk, it just kind of looks like a sidewalk. So all of those little things were done to make it really feel like you were outside. And it, it's pretty effective. Um, this is the ice cream parlor. We gave it kind of a 50s diner look. Um, residents gained so much weight, they actually had to cut back on the cookies and the ice cream uh, because this was so popular. Um, and then this is uh, the dining room that's kind of, uh, kind of in the main space where they might take their lunch. Um, but you can imagine, there are at times 53, 52 plus 30, there are 85 people with dementia in this space during the day. That sounds chaotic, but it works 
because they break them into different activities. They do parades. They have antique car shows where they bring the cars into the main street because this is a big antique car area. Um, they do all kinds of things. The local high school across the way, their band, their chorus come in once a week and they sing and they participate. Um, very, very different. These guys really believe in the arts. The idea of music is a big part of their life. Uh, when they hired the staff, they went through 250 applicants to select 12 staff members. Because they said, when you join us, you are going to dance with the residents, you are going to sing with the residents. They were looking for, that were really going to participate in what these residents, and it's one of the things that makes this really beautiful, because it really does work quite well. Pros of this, very engaging. Uh, the social connections are tremendous because they're connecting with a lot of people from outside also, the, the adult daycare folks that are coming in. Uh, and the idea of the integrated adult daycare I mentioned is really one of the aspects of this that works so well. The cons. Uh, a lot of people would say, well, where's the intimacy? Let's say I don't want to be here with 80 other people. There are niches that you can get into, uh, but the idea of privacy and intimacy is a little different here. Um, this is the one that I think people struggle with. It's kind of a simulated reality. All of this isn't real. It's fake. Um, but for the folks living there, it feels real to them. Um, so in a way, you could say it works. And then there's always this. This was a very expensive project. Um, not most people could afford to do that. But I think it really did open some eyes in terms of memory care not being just 12, 10 to 12 rooms. Here it's 80 people, and it still works very, very well. So just a very different way to approach the last one we would talk about is the village, and maybe Dustin, you can jump in here because sure. you're certainly familiar with this. Do you want the clicker? Yeah, sure. So this is a slightly different strategy. It doesn't. It's a, a way of kind of looking at this ability to bring people together uh, and provide flexibility to move uh, around the plan. But the thing that's really interesting about uh, this project, and we're going to reference one that's actually uh, in the Netherlands, uh, Hodgeway, as Eric mentioned earlier. Um, but this model is very different because it uses the architecture itself to define interior courtyard spaces uh, that the residents have the flexibility to uh, to enter at will so what you can see here in this plan uh, if we jump through the white that you're looking at uh, let me see if I can find the pointer here all of the these white spaces those are all of the resident rooms uh, and some of the common spaces uh, in areas like this as well um, but when we jump ahead you see that the rest of the plan is all the series and of interconnected courtyards. So a lot of times we struggle when we have these, these outdoor spaces with you know, large green areas. How do we sort of keep residents from wandering uh, or leaving uh, the area? This opportunity in this model allows us to have all of those garden spaces and not worry about the residents leaving. Uh, so as you can see, there's only little areas where staff would have the opportunity to, uh, to leave uh, the, the campus in that way. One of so, the things about this is it's such a big scale. If you jump back to the previous slide, you're talking about 23 houses of yeah. six to seven residents and Sorry. 152 residents total. So this is a very large community. Um, the other thing that's interesting about these guys is what they do is because it's only six to seven residents in a household, they try to put six or seven residents that have things in common together. So let's say there were six or seven residents that had a, a sports background in some way. They might put them together because they, they figure they're going to have a lot in common to talk about. If there were some folks that were in the financial world, they might put those six or seven people together. If there were six or seven women that were simply homemakers uh, and stayed at home most of their lives, they might put them together because they would have a different set of things to talk about. And I think that's a way of creating connections between people very logically. And again, those outdoor spaces start to, to work off of these areas that Eric is talking about. So if you have those connections of a, of, a, of a collective group with similar interests, then they can integrate with certain areas of the plan. And this, you know, there's seven different settings, but you can see how some of them start to take shape. Some of them are more open, some of them are, are smaller, some of them are are larger and could house a, a larger group of people. What so I there's a lot of variety to the plan. What's different about this than the Main Street is the Main Street was focused on one area. Everybody went to one area. This is such a scale that there are so many different areas that you really feel like you're living in a village. 
You can wander, you can go through a little alley, you think you're going somewhere, but you're just gonna pop up into another courtyard. And there's enough staff around that the entire area is completely safe. And there's a lot of uh, discussion about how, you know, how do you locate a resident should you need to, or you know, keeping the scheduling issue. And I believe that a lot of these types of projects start to rely on technology in order to monitor uh, these spaces. So with, uh, you know, as we see all of those technologies coming to fruition, uh, we, we have the ability to do certain things of this nature. But again, these, these garden exterior spaces uh, provide a lot of opportunity, but also for natural light to come into the plant. So again, there's really not a lot of thick areas to the plant. You have a, a lot of, of window walls. Uh, but this is sort of a, a little bit of what those spaces actually start to take shape. I think that as opposed to the Main Street concept, you get a little bit more of a sense of authenticity in this type of environment, uh, just because of the way that the plan is integrating uh, with those outdoor spaces. Um, but again, you do have these, uh, these certain areas. Uh, in this plan, it's, it is an exterior space, so you're actually outside walking up to uh, a grocery store or a post office, unlike the Main Street concept where that was an interior area. But again, the pros of this type of environment are that this sort of sense of engagement, and not just a general sense of engagement, but a sense of engagement with people who have like set of interests uh, or, or have a similar history or background to, to one another. Again, the social connectivity of this plan is, is incredible. I mean, the ability for those uh, different uh, neighborhoods to, to interconnect, uh, both within themselves and then also at these common spaces. Um, and again, it's a familiar environment because you're going to the grocery store, you're going to the post office like you might have in your past. Does the ratio of patient to care change much between these different models? Definitely. I mean, I'm not sure what ratio of staff to residents in the household model, but well, this was... Like in a greenhouse model, which is 10 residents, typically it's two staff members. That's all that's on the, on the, in the building. But in a, yes, he asked about staffing ratios for these different types of memory care. That in a greenhouse or a small house that we talked to, it might be just two staff members in a household. Here, because I think of the expanse of it, it's, I think it said there were 250 staff, but it's that's not all. That's so, not yeah. all at one time. So some of these do have higher staffing ratios than others, and it's one of the things that we would certainly need to look at ahead of time to determine where you want to be from a staffing model. Some people do think that memory care does require more staffing than other levels of care, because you're trying to monitor people who are dealing with cognitive issues. And at yes. a larger scale of the plan, there is some greater economy to the, you know, you can have a little bit more redundancy of the staff responsibilities. Yes, okay. Is one of these on? Is this one on? Let me just make sure it's working first. <laughs> it's on. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, throughout all the models we've seen, I didn't think there was adequate planning for the staff or contracted out services. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a good point. One of the things in most of these models that we didn't spend a lot of time on today, and we could talk about as a whole separate uh, session, is the idea that we don't want the staff to be front and center. Okay, we want the staff to be there, we want it to be a nurturing, secure environment, but we don't want to see the staff. And that's what most people's attitude today is toward these memory care projects. Uh, oftentimes there's not an open care base, that's long gone, we don't do that anymore, because that's an old remnant of a hospital. We don't want that open care base. Uh, most people do a small staff office that might have some interior windows that look out onto the spaces, but that seems to be the way that most people are approaching these now. And again, the ultimate goal is to make these feel as much like home as possible. You certainly don't have a staff desk in your home. Um, Good. Locker space, changeover and shift changes oh. between C and A. Sure. We, yeah. I'm back here again. I said there's no shift change opportunities, and this was one of the criticisms at one of the places we visited, that when the shifts are changing, 
there's no adequate bathrooms, there's no adequate locker space, there's no, they're all there at the same time and they're, one's coming in, the other's going off. And there didn't seem to be any of that. Well, again, I think it, you have to look at the size of the community that you're developing. If you're developing a small house with only 13 residents, that, sh that shift change is not a big deal because you're talking about two or three people. Now, if you're doing a bigger project like this where it's literally 30 or 40 staff changing at one time, obviously that has to be dealt with and that's a very critical part to the success of that project. Um, but certainly, I mean, staff changing rooms is something we have to think about. Um, uh, but we want, I think the, the simple point I was trying to make is that we want to try to make the staff areas be as much behind the scenes as possible because we don't want those out front. This is, this is not a project that we're trying to emphasize the staff. We're trying to emphasize the fact that it's a very residential setting. Uh, feels like home. So as much as we can do that, that's certainly what we try to do. But we don't want to overlook all those other parts that are needed to make it work. Absolutely. So some of the cons of this uh, type of environment is just a general sense of feasibility. This is not something that would fit on any campus. Even if you do have a large greenfield site, this is definitely a, a different strategy. Um, one of the things, as Eric mentioned at the Alzheimer's Resource Center, was that we tried to use this type of strategy with a lot of their existing buildings. So there is sort of a lot of, you know, of ideology behind this plan that we can translate into uh, other types of plans as well. Uh, but again, there's this general sense of simulated reality as opposed to the real world interactions that uh, one might be used to. So I, this takes a slightly different approach with those spaces being on, on the exterior of the building, but uh, again, they aren't completely authentic. One thing before we move into this, this idea of looking at some other things, um, there's, this is whole one level of thought that you're creating a secure locked environment. There's certainly another group of folks that feel like that's not the right way to deal with memory care. These are still people. They still have feelings. We shouldn't be locking them up. And certainly there are some folks that feel that that's the proper way to deal with it. Um, the security issue has to be dealt with then because these, people, these folks, depending on their level of dementia, they can get themselves in trouble. Um, so I think even with with the Alzheimer's Resource Center, uh, Michael Smith and I have done some presentations on memory care. And he's, he's also talked about this, that maybe all of this isn't the right way to deal with memory care. That at a certain level, those folks can still function and operate and live very comfortably in a normal setting with some support. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind, that um, we're not saying this is the way it has to be done. Uh, there are other ways to deal with it. So as far as um, when we think about just in very, very broad terms, um, what the current expectations are, we want a safe environment. We want to be respectful of the residents and their needs. Uh, we want to make sure it's secure. We want to make sure that folks have the ability to reflect on their, on their life in a very positive way. Nurturing is a word that often comes up. This needs to be a nurturing uh, environment. And then also, I think this is really a critical one. And we've seen this with a number of projects, the Sylvestri being a good example that some of you visited, where they simply took the staff from their old assisted living, they moved them into the brand new memory care with no training, and it was a disaster. I mean, a complete disaster. So much so that we had decentralized everything and we had, you know, all the care bases were tucked away in the little alcoves. They were used to sitting all in one command center. So what did they do? They went to Home Depot. They bought desks, shelves, they took a conference room over and they created their own central care base in the middle of the plan. And it, they, were, they were floored. They couldn't believe the staff did that. But, but again, that's what they had known for their whole life as far as how you provide tra training and care. You have to train staff differently to think differently in memory care. It's a very, very specific staff that, that has a certain level of training that's specific to this. And then some of the involving expectations that we're starting to think about a little differently than we have in the past. These communities need to be very engaging, okay? You're not dealing with the deficiencies. You're dealing with what people still can do. And you need to take what they can do and really nurture that and develop it in a very positive way. We want to think about stimulating activities and growth. 
It's not that they're on the decline. There's still a lot of things these folks can do. Let's take advantage of those things and really uh, develop them in a way that, that makes them continue to grow. Independence and interdependence, still very important at this level. We want to make sure people still feel like they have the ability to personalize spaces that reflect their personality. Um, connections, <clears throat> not only to staff, but to other family members that are authentic. Um, I think that's where the, you know, the social connections, people to people connections, really are very, very important to making a person feel like they still have self-worth. Um, and the idea of just all of that makes their life still very meaningful. Um, again, they have a disease that's going to probably result in decline. But let's not just talk about the decline. Let's talk about what they still can do. And then let's make sure that everyone still has an identity. They're just not lumped together as a group of folks that have dementia. Uh, that's really the wrong way to think about this. So we can take a little bit of time, but we'll run through these pretty quickly. Um, there's a, a book that Alan Power wrote uh, that really focuses on dementia beyond the disease. So just as Eric is talking about how um, there's a sense of celebrating and really focusing on the things that a resident may, able, may still be able to do, uh, these are the seven domains uh, that really start to integrate uh, those ideas. So again, a sense of, ide of identity, a sense of connectedness, both to around them, so any other residents that they might be living with. Um, but also, this sense of connectedness is, is a little bit broader, so it's connected also to the staff that are, are caring for them, connected back to their families who might be outside or even further away, and then also connected to the, the community at large, because a lot of times uh, there are services and integrated connections uh, to, the, to the surrounding areas that can be uh, positive as well. Um, as, at the Alzheimer's Resource Center, we saw a real focus uh, on people who are at the very early stages of dementia, uh, able to integrate with the community before they even live there. So that sense of connectedness at an earlier, uh, an earlier part in the process. Um, again, this idea of autonomy, we've seen that uh, handled several different ways with the, the household model uh, all through uh, into this Main Street uh, concept where there is a sense of ability to move without the plan, to experience different environments and different activities uh, with, with, while still maintaining that sense of freedom uh, and safety, really. Um, and safety is, is often a really big one that works sort of uh, in tandem with this sense of autonomy. How much safety do you have to provide, or how much autonomy can you provide while still maintaining uh, that level of safety? Again, meaning. What are, what are the things that provide meaning uh, to, to a resident, uh, to an individual? What helps uh, or what allows them, whether it's spiritually uh, or emotionally, in different ways that allow them to, to build up that sense of meaning? Again, growth. This is something that I think it, it often doesn't get a lot of attention, um, but it's not about the decline that's happening, it's about how we can continue to encourage them uh, to grow and evolve as individuals. Uh, and so what, whether that's some type of uh, activities that they're involved in, in um, whether it's physically, whether it's you know, wellness, those types of things, uh, how do we sort of stimulate that growth? Uh, so Great that example of that, many of you probably have seen and heard about Glenn Campbell, who just recently died, who had Alzheimer's. And when he had developed the disease to a certain level, they decided they were going to do a, a final world tour. And you probably have read about this. And they were only supposed to have done 20 cities. But what would happen is when Glenn got on stage, he immediately was the old Glenn Campbell. You would have never known he had dementia because he was in his comfortable element, his comfortable zone. It was so popular that he ended up doing a world tour that lasted well over a year. And it got to the point as his, as his dementia progressed, he would actually talk to the audience about that and say, hey guys, I think you all know what I'm dealing with. I may forget the words to a song, you know, please don't be upset. And the audience just obviously loved it. Um, but it was just an example of taking a person who obviously to him music was his life. When you put him back on that stage where he had spent so much of his life, it's almost like the dementia recited. It went away and he was his old self again. But then you took him off stage and all of a sudden he's obviously a person living with dementia. So it's just a great example of how the environment in creating a, a, an environment that is reflective of that person in their history can completely change that person. 
And a lot of times those are exactly the things that contribute to one's sense of joy. So that's the seventh point and maybe one of the most ambiguous points, but really how do we allow the sense of happiness, the sense of joy uh, to flourish? And I think all of these points uh, help to contribute to that. So we'll just run through these uh, quickly. Again, identity, whether it's something small, you know, a sense of or uh, integrating something that's close to them. If someone was very, very much about the plants that they had on their, their windowsill uh, at home, providing spaces for them to do that as well. Um, so it's really this, uh, their stuff, you know, whether, you know, we see it sometimes integrated into this idea of a memory box, but how can we really make their whole environment that's, that's their personal space really reminiscent of the things that they hold true to their own identity? Um, and again, those are, are the things that allow the spaces to be differentiated so that they know that that's the space that they can call home uh, and it's different from their neighbors. So those sort of senses of individuality. Uh, and then also there's a sense of flexibility that really just uh, is part of that as well. Just some examples of, again, the idea of color. How important color is to making, you know, someone's door might be painted or highlighted in a certain color. That's just a simple cueing method to get a person to realize, oh, that's my door because there's that color that I like so much. Uh, very simple ways, subtle ways to uh, address the environment. And they, they do have to be flexible because there's going to be turnover and there's going to, you know, family is going to want to come in and bring new items or, you know, how can we provide for the opportunity to that, for that to happen? Again, just another example of how color is, is involved so you would, you would know that this is, is your front door. And we see, you know, things as interesting as, you know, queuing on uh, room numbers, whether it's just, you know, that little icon of a, of a cow or of a, you know, of a windmill could be just the thing that allows the resident to, to find their way. You back. know, allowing a piece of artwork to be sitting outside their door. What a great queuing device. If I'm walking down and I have, you know, I used to have a dog that looked just like that and that's my, somehow someone gave me that. There's no question I'm going to know that's my room because yeah. there's that dog that I've known forever. Um, what a great way to cue someone back to a room. Definitely. And this was Williamsburg Landing, and this was quite a few years ago, their original memory care, and that's when we were first doing these curio cabinets. Um, limited success. I think they, they certainly make the corridor a little more interesting. Uh, you've got all these little knickknacks in the window, but I think we've moved away from that a little bit. Uh, we just have found that they're not. There's other ways to do queuing that's more effective than that. And there's that table that we talked about. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. That this is, you know, an heirloom maybe from the family that a person walking, the doors are always open. So they see that table and they go, oh, that's my room because there's my table. And this is just another example of, you know, how the room can really come alive with someone's stuff. And that. Now, as an uh, owner, how much you want to allow people to do this, that's your, tr that's sure, your call. Yeah. yeah. But again, it's just another example of how the, the sense of identity can be reinforced with, uh, by integrating things that, that one might be familiar with. We want to make sure that rooms have the ability to be personalized and we very often, we love window seats, we think they're a very nice residential touch, but the idea of just some shelving in a room so that residents have the ability to personalize their room. It's a very simple thing to do, but it does make for a, a room that really reflects that person's personality. Yeah, so shelving, artwork, accessories, those types of things. Again, yeah, just another example. Connectedness, so we made a, a few comments about how the connection between the inside spaces and the outside spaces is extremely important, both for lighting and then also providing those safe opportunities for a resident to, to access the outside. Um, but also just, you know, creating these inviting social spaces, whether they're independent throughout the interior of the plan or whether they are, you know, these outdoor spaces as well. And really trying to vary the size so that there are some spaces that are larger where you can have a, gr a greater group of people coming together uh, and contributing to a large sense of connectedness or just two residents meeting in a, a small parlor or a space of that nature. And those two can, ha uh, you know, share some, some time interacting. Um, so really that variety uh, in connected opportunities is really important. So here's an example of where we see, you know, a small group of people that could be co collecting around the fireplace. There's some, some seating opportunities for uh, dining with the, the booth seating to the left and for the bistro area back beyond. So really there's just those se different sense of spaces. So it's not just like one big open area, really breaking down the scale. 
This is a little bistro environment. Again, just that idea of coming up and getting a cup of coffee, which might be a familiar sort of routine opportunity, but could provide a connection to some of the staff members and creating those meaningful inter interactions. We had some of those at breakfast just in the last two days, the opportunity to connect with uh, some of your staff here, just is really, really great. This is over at Williamsburg Landing again. Uh, just the opportunities, this happens to be right outside of a place where there's a little theater, very, very popular. It's a little ice cream parlor and they do social events with a, with a movie and ice cream all together. Uh, just a way to kind of group things together. There's a little library in the back there with a little fireplace. So again, all these just little different vignettes of opportunities for social connections. But really, it's, we're looking at the idea of how your activities that are, are programmed can be integrated with our design sense to the architecture itself. So how can we provide spaces uh, that make your job of programming uh, easier to create these connections? And again, this is an example of how you know, the outdoor is connected to this porch, and the porch is connected to, to a larger outdoor space. At Vincent Hall with the Sylvestri, it really was the whole idea, and I think there's a plan coming up, the idea was that every, the whole plan is focusing around four gardens. The buildings basically define the garden, so you can't get go anywhere. They're very secure. But the idea is residents can freely go out into these gardens whenever they want to, and they're very safe environments. And here's some examples of what, I mean, each of the gardens has a different character. One's a gardening center, one's more of a statuary kind of thing. Again, this, uh, we talked a little bit about the idea of security, but how do we provide security in a way that's not sort of overt? So, per, you know, a fence or something of that nature that would be, might be scary to approach. You know, how can we use landscaping or how can we integrate the architecture in ways uh, that, that really provide that sense of security? So you, we can do that by, you know, including things that are familiar to, to someone, uh, including things that are comfortable, including things that are private uh, and things that are, are supportive of, uh, those ideas of security. Just another example of a resident room. Um, uh, and again, the use of color, bringing the exterior materials inside the building. So a stone wall that you normally see outside, bring it to the inside, and that's a way to maybe create better inside-outside connections. So and we've a, done that on a number of projects. This is obviously a very safe environment. This is within the resident room, but it's providing this uh, ability to securely kind of step out into this bay uh, and, and feel like you, you have a, a nice view to the outside. And again, we mentioned the lighting before. Lighting's very important, keeping it so that there's no glare, you know, bouncing the light off the ceiling, just a nice, soft, subtle way to do lighting. Uh, making sure that things like the devices, um, you know, for you and I, this is all second nature. Uh, light switch, very easy. A thermostat's very easy. But we need to really think about that in a memory care setting because we want residents still to be able to control their own environment. And maybe we need to think about some of this stuff a little bit differently than we, when we, we do normally. Yeah, think about transitions, uh, think about slips when you go from a carpet to a hard floor. All of those kinds of things really have to be thought about because in a memory care setting, they're even more important. And again, there's that, that European shower that we talked about uh, in the corner of the bathroom. Again, very safe, grab bars are in place, um, but it allows bathing to happen in the privacy of your own room, and that's so important in today's world. We just do, we don't do central bathing anymore at all. It's very obvious, but to someone with memory issues, cognitive issues, that's a very helpful thing to know which is the hot and which is the cold. You, you avoid burns. Mirrors are an issue with memory care. When people look at themselves in a mirror, they don't recognize the person looking back at them because they vision themselves from 20 years ago. They see the person in the mirror and they wonder who that is. So sometimes we try to stay away from mirrors. And what we can do is, I think the next slide shows it. Instead of a mirror, you put a piece of artwork there. Um, we don't do that often, uh, but we often do eliminate the mirrors in a memory care bathroom, uh, which is interesting. And then uh, smart technology, I think this is one of the things that we're just starting to see uh, change memory care because environments are so important to monitoring, to security, uh, letting, you're trying to give the residents as much freedom as possible to go wherever they want, whenever they want. Well, there's a level of risk with that. So I think technology is really going to help us with that. In this particular one, we're talking about lighting um, and the idea that through different Kelvin, we really can create a very different feeling in a room. 
And it's something that I think is being explored a lot more. Uh, just change, I mean, this is the same light levels, but you can see different levels of Kelvin, 2400, 3800, and 5500. You can see how much of a difference it changes the feel of those rooms uh, pretty considerably. And sometimes the, uh, that really serves two purposes in this type of environment. One, it can start to replicate the different lighting effects that we see throughout the day. So just as we try to integrate natural lighting, we can use artificial lighting to replicate the, you know, the, the yellowness of a sunrise or a sunset or the, the brightness of, of a sun at the full time during the day. So we can use technology in order to help uh, that. And that can be very helpful to, to provide or to reinforce these circadian rhythms of the, of the residents. Uh, the other thing that we're using it for is a sense of, or this idea of chromotherapy. So could uh, you know, a very soothing blue or purple tone uh, calm someone down who might be uh, in, a, in a frenzy? Or is there you know, something stimulating about a warmer color? So how can we use this technology in order to create environments and really just changing the temperature of lighting? I mean, it changes the whole space. It changes the color of the walls. It changes the color of the carpets. Okay, Barb, we probably want to wrap it up then. I think we're a little, few minutes past, so we can just go very quickly through some of these final things. Again, technology, in terms of wandering, uh, there's ways of, of, of lack of a better term, tracking someone, making sure you understand where they are within your environment through technology, putting in something in the sole of their shoe. So they may not even know it's there, but you have a way to make sure that you know where they are all day long. And these things are becoming less futuristic. I mean, it's not strange to be wearing a smartwatch. I see many of you have them as well. So it's, it's something that's becoming more and more popular. Okay. We could continue here, just more about technology. I just uh, uh, autonomy, again, making sure that folks have the ability to express themselves as, as individuals. Um, connection to the outdoors is one of the things that we always promote. We just think that's so important to a successful memory care, that folks can still get outside on a nice day, or at least they can sit inside and feel like they're connected to the outside. And again, the sense of individual schedule providing those uh, community spaces that they can, can come to and, and really do that on their own timeline. And again, timeline. down at the Silvestri, this really, it, it's, it's kind of funny that when you look at this plan from 10,000 feet, it kind of looks like a stealth bomber, doesn't it? And that was completely unintentional. It kind of looks like a stealth plane. But anyway, it is designed around uh, four neighborhoods so that basically all of, and the other thing that we really like in many of these memory care plans is that corridors are not double loaded. You don't go across the hall right into somebody else's room. In this case, when you come out of your room, you're always looking right into a garden wherever you are in the plan. And I think that gives a pe person the ability to cue to know exactly kind of where they are within their environment. And each of the gardens had a different, uh, different kind of design, different meaning. Uh, and again, here's one of those cars kind of looking into the gardens. This is the breezeway between two gardens. At times, they can open up doors on both sides, and you can literally walk right through from one garden to yeah, another. The pathway of the concrete outside starts to continue right into the plan, so you really can, can traverse through inside, outside. Yeah, and just, uh, and again, just the, the settings that we're creating with, uh, you know, country kitchens, very residential. Uh, Again, as Eric said, the ability to sort of just circulate in through the kitchen like you would in your own home. Okay. I think we just have a lot of examples of these. We'll flick through them pretty quickly. Uh, meaning is, uh, again, this sort of how, how do you tie all of this together and still provide uh, these quiet spaces that might be uh, for, for introspective reflection uh, and the ability, or obviously respectful, but many times family is where we see this uh, this idea of meaning uh, coming to light. So where are the spaces where the family can come and feel like they're at home and really feel like they have time to spend uh, in a great environment with their, their loved ones? Um, but this sense of spiritual space, how uh, we can use lighting and materiality uh, to provide those types of really interesting spaces. Just some other examples of things that, um, you know, may, maybe not important to your group, but certainly to some individuals, this might be very important. So whether it's a meditative space, uh, you know, if it's uh, a spiritual space, uh, whether it's a fitness space, and, and then growth. We talked a little bit about that, how life, we can really reinforce lifelong learning, personal development, and continue to, to have people grow and really bring out the, the, the things that they are still able to do. Um, so library spaces, you know, how can we encourage that type of, of learning? Um, maybe it's musical involvement. And again, this is a place where connectivity uh, to, to outside surrounding area can, be, can overlap with this uh, idea of growth by bringing in uh, other individuals.
Uh, painting is one. This is actually a really cool one because at the Alzheimer's Resource Center, a lot of their residents uh, are involved in this art program that really is populated throughout their entire community. And some really cool, uh, cool paintings come of it. We see a lot of uh, you know, people who like working with plants or have a lot of experience with that, and that's another way that we can continue to, to reinforce that growth. Again, the family connections, uh, how, how can we see uh, growth in the connection of, of the, the um, intergenerational connections are, are another really big thing. So it's not just about the family members coming to visit, but it's about you know, learning from them and also uh, the, the children learning from, from their loved ones. And the last one is joy. I mean, it's a term that you probably normally wouldn't associate with memory care or dementia. Is there any joy in that? Most people would say no. But the idea is that's our end goal. We want these people to still experience joy in their lives. And how do we go about doing that? And I think that's a, and if we can solve that, I think you've solved the issue. Um, we're still trying to make sure these people feel like they're living a meaningful life and they're experiencing joy. And, uh, and that's really, I think, the one we're ending on. And, and then, you know, think about what does joy mean? I mean, for a lot of folks, it's the connections to other people that creates the joy. You know, it's the friends that you've made, it's the family that you, you, you're still with. And, uh, you know, we really need to embrace that and make sure that we're taking that as far as we can so that these folks are still living lives that don't feel like they're just in decline. Uh, even though that's the reality we need to really offset that. And joy, joy is so much bigger than just happiness. Happiness can just be a mood or a temperate, a, you know, a, an intermediate phase, but this, this long-term sense of joy uh, can be contributed to in these ways. Um, so a lot of times, these, the spaces that we can provide that give uh, beautiful lighting situations and connections outside. Um, That's a happy room. Yeah. I mean, I, I would feel good if I was in that room. <laughs> Compare that to a room where you had dark walls and no daylight and artificial light. Yeah. Completely different feeling. That room itself creates a sense of joy. And it's not just about the room, but it's about the providing that space where people can come together and, and benefit from that as well. Yeah. The residential aspect, of just being comfortable in a small residential setting, I think that's also very important. Someone sitting in their favorite chair, at their favorite spot at the table. Art is, the arts are certainly a big part of memory care. Music, dancing, artwork, uh, all of that, I think, are things that we really need to embrace and really develop more strongly than we have in many projects. Again, I think we showed a similar picture to this, but just how, do, how does dining integrate into those areas so that there's living spaces connected to, uh, to dining spaces, bright colors, interesting fabrics, lots of interesting uh, connected spaces. outdoor amenities <laughs> that sort of can reference the, the long-term memories, as Eric mentioned, that, that some of the residents might have. And maybe some of you guys had written uh, or uh, read the, the book put out by uh, Richard Taylor, who was a, a doctor living with Alzheimer's. Uh, don't recall, is he still alive? I don't remember if he still is or not, but what's interesting is as his disease was ongoing, he was continually speaking about it lecturing about it and talking about uh, you know, making sure that people still feel like human beings uh, all the way through. And a very, very good read, uh, but some very insightful things. And basically he's saying that a person is still a human being up to their last breath, and we need to treat them that way. And I think that's the last slide that we have. So thank you. Sorry we went yeah. a little bit long. Thank you. Just, just, do you want to just take a few minutes? Yeah, if anybody has a few questions, we'll certainly stick around here. This was very educational, and I appreciate all the effort that is going into it. But I'd like to know when we're going to get more specific information about Falcon's Landing yes. instead of the general. Well, this, the idea of this was just to show you the state of the business. This is where memory care trends are going right now. How we apply them to Falcon's Landing, that's the next session. Um, we'll have to talk about We'll have to talk about that. Um, 
I don't know, Barb, if you want to offer anything more on that. But. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.